and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and everybody say, amen, amen. Welcome to church, friends. So glad you're here. If you're just joining us online, thanks for joining us. Everybody in the room, we'd love for you to try to meet a few people and then uh, find a seat and continue with our gathering. Uh, giving goes a long ways to help 
us as a church family, uh, because that one tells us like what our operating budget can be in terms of uh, the ministry teams and the ongoing ministry expenses for that. So I highly encourage you, instead of just giving every payday, or however it is that you do that, uh, to actually schedule recurring, and that enables us to kind of project. So thank you for praying through that. And now, let me just say welcome back to our series. We're studying the book of Acts, a series of all things possible. Week one, we saw this impossible reconciliation for God to reconcile with the very people that murdered his son. And yet right after Pentecost and Acts 2, as the first thing he does, he reconciles them to himself. Uh, week two, we saw how uh, healing, impossible healing, is possible with God. And we saw that uh, as we looked in Acts chapter 3. And so, to be more specific, we're going to be going back to the same story in Acts 3, because there is more about what our God can do in there. So I'm going to read it afresh to you, Acts 3, 1 to 10, if you have your Bibles. I uh, can go ahead and turn there, and uh, we will also put this up on the screen. Acts 3, 1 to 10. So now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called the beautiful, in order to make alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter, I'm going to switch my iPad here, uh, when he saw Peter and John go to the temple ground, he began asking to receive a charitable gift. Verse 4, but Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, look at us. And he gave them uh, his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. And grasping him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as being the very one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for charitable gifts, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So, this man has been this way from the time he was born. And so you want to talk about taking on an identity. This is all that he had ever known. We are told in the beginning of this passage that he was being carried. This is an ongoing daily reality. He cannot make it to the state on his own, but he was being carried. Figuratively, what that tells us is that he is used to having others carry him. Now, do not forget, this man was not internally free while he was physically bound. No, in verse 4, Peter had to tell him, look at us. His head was hung down, his head was hung in shame. What, who he was externally had become what he believed and who he believed he was internally. Rejection was what this man knew. Not once, not twice. In fact, we're told that everybody recognized it. I don't think I would recognize somebody that I had seen before asking for money, but he was there day in, and he was there day out, and week in, and week out, month in, and month out, year after year. He had become a fixed part of the scenery around Jerusalem, so much so that even when he's not sitting in the spot he had always been, that he's walking and leaping and praising God and doing what he's never done, people recognize him, which means that he may not have been looking up at them, but they had certainly been looking down at him, there was a widespread rejection in this man's life. I think it's very interesting that when Peter is speaking to him, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Doesn't that just kind of stand out? You know, like, why, why is he throwing the Nazarene bit in there? Where is that coming from? Do you remember what Nathaniel had said in the Gospels? How can anything good come from Nazareth? This was a part of the reason that Jesus was rejected because the teachers all said, well, there's no way that the Messiah could come from Nazareth. How can anything good come from Nazareth? And so this is part of why Jesus is rejected, and he's actually drawing attention to the fact that he's from Nazareth. He said that he came from Nazareth. And so here's Peter, and he's looking at a man who has been rejected. He has not been able to go in the gate, into the temple, but rather he's been laid at the gate He's been laid outside of the temple, and he tells it in the name of Jesus Christ, who was also rejected. 
I tell you all. In the name of Jesus Christ, who's also been rejected the way that you've been rejected, I'm telling you to walk. Not limp, not crawl, walk. And then we read that Peter grasped him by the right hand. This word is uh, for grasp, the it's actually used of like seizing, arresting, apprehending, but very interestingly, it's also the word used of catching fish. So whenever we would read about Peter catching fish or not catching any fish, this is the word, piazzo, okay? Do not forget that Peter, as a fisherman from Galilee, in their society, they looked down upon the fisherman. He was not seen as superior in any way, shape, or form. And Jesus came and said, I want you to follow me. You will no longer be catching fish, but you will be a fisher of Men, and here he is, and, and, and the word used is he catches. He reaches down into he reaches down into the depth, and he catches this man up for what God is doing in his life. It's also interesting that Peter is not doing the same thing that those that had carried him daily were doing. That's not what Peter's doing here. This man does not need the same thing he once needed before. Every day he was being carried. But Peter, we read in the past tense, and what's we'll called the aorist tense, the punctilious tense, meaning it all in one moment of time, he takes him up. He takes him up. He doesn't take him up to carry him, he just takes him up. And what happens is in an instant, this man's given an identity. Right? I mean, he goes from sitting to standing, from being weak to being strong, from uh, being at the mercy to being a recipient of God's mercy, from every day versus an instant. And verse 8 says, he was leaping up. Just imagine this man sitting on the ground, his legs have never been used before, and it's not like, I mean, it's pretty impressive when a giraffe is born, right? And the thing's like standing up right away, it's like, that, how are you, that's weird, you know? Um, but it's kind of getting his legs under it. No, this man, emaciated legs that had never been used, there was no strength in them, God healed him so instantly, he leaps up. Think about that. He leaps up and then he began walking. It. And the word for walking even is parapeteo. It's not just walk, it's to walk around. He began walking. He didn't just like take his, his first step and then fall and everybody, like mom and dad, yay, you know, he walked. No, no, he's walking around. He left up, he's walking around. Like he's been healed fully, holy, or at least it seems. At least it seems. But can you imagine how much it would have meant for him to be able to enter the temple with them? Get up and go in. He goes from being an outsider to being an insider. He goes from being not allowed to being allowed. He goes from unworthy to worthy in the eyes of others. We read he was walking and leaping and praising God. Not even he left once and then said a nice word about God. He's leaping, he's walking, he's praising, ongoing. And this man has been crippled. God healed him physically. He's healed. Giving God the glory, he's praising God. But along with this physical condition came another situation, which we talked about last week. We're going to go deeper in today, and that's rejection. Look at what we actually read next in verse 11. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico, and Solomon is completely astonished. That doesn't that stand out? He was clinging.
how do we be clinging to the fears of John? It's not a case of confusion. He doesn't believe that he was healed by them. Remember, he's praising God. But he is used to relating to others in this way. He's used to depending on others in this way. He's even used to being defined by others in this way. So we're seeing that something changed. And he was changed, but there's still more change to come. His ankles, his legs, they had been wholly healed, but he needed whole healing. His heart, his mind, to be able to receive and to be able to accept and respond to the healing that had happened physically for him. You see, rejection throws roots deep down into the one rejected. So deep down, often we believe that's who we are. Have any of you been rejected before? Of course you have. I can tell by looking at you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> You haven't been rejected yet. Okay. Um, has anyone been called something other than what God called you before? Yes, you have. So what do we do whenever we've been rejected? Okay. There are four different ways that we can respond to rejection. Only one of these is to walk in freedom. Okay. So let's just go through these one by one. Let's see them in the text as well. The first thing that we often do when rejected is that we actually lower our life to live by it. So we're rejected, we lower our life to live by it. I'm going to kind of put this chain on, which is, you know, attached here to the floor. Whenever we lower our life to live by rejection, that's about being set free, but not actually walking free. This is about being healed, but it's not actually, you know, living in our wholeness. This is when the chain is actually been broken, like boom, it's been released from the floor, and yet we keep it on our wrist as if we are still bound. It's not off of our soul. It's about living as a captive when we don't have to. Think of Moses, right? Moses tried when he was young to rise up and be a part of liberating the Israelites, but he was rejected by the very people he wanted to see set free. He was rejected by them. And so what did he do? He spent uh, the next 40 years doing what? Was he seeking the Lord for their freedom still? Was he trying other ways and innovative ways in order to secure their freedom? No, he spent the next 40 years tending sheep in the wilderness, in the desert. And he actually lost any hope or any desire being used by God for his own people's freedom. So much so that when God shows up in the burning bush, he says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to speak through you. You will go and set my people free because I'm going to do this. Moses is like, this is amazing. God's like talking to me through this burning bush. And he's like, no thanks, God. Find somebody else. What happened to Moses? What was in his heart had been raked out of his heart. He had lowered himself to live by the rejection that he had experienced 40 years earlier. Think of King Saul. Similarly, he was uh, the first of Israel's kings. He was called by God. He was anointed by God until he disobeys. Once Saul is told that he's going to be replaced, from then on, he actually lowers his life to live by the rejection. He pursues David. He attempts to murder David time and time again. He could have repented. No, he could have sought the Lord. He could have served the Lord faithfully with the remainder of his kingship. He could have served the Lord by serving David even after. His eternal inheritance would have been great, but he rejects the Lord, and he turns to other means. Once he hears the rejection, he only lowered himself to it. What happens when you lower yourself to live by the rejection that you have experienced? You actually shape your thoughts, and you orient your actions to align to the word of rejection. And that's how you end up living as a captive to it. It's the kid in elementary school. He's told he's a loser, he's never going to amount to anything, whatever, because academics aren't his strong suit. So then his whole life, he doesn't even try. And surprise, surprise, he failed from there on out. That is an example of lowering life to live by the rejection experienced. This is you. Have you had something spoken about you or something said to you, maybe even decades ago, and you're lowering your life? Rejection. It's just a suburb of that holiday. A 
think this is a pretty common one, to suffer silently. When we do this, we're actually living with this internal scarring that we, we don't let it show, uh, but it's getting re-incised regularly. And so it never heals. It's just internal. We see a lot of this in the scripture. I think it's Zacchaeus. Uh, Zacchaeus is this corrupt tax collector. Uh, he's a man that's hated by his fellow countrymen for the role that he played in extorting them. Just to understand a little bit about Zacchaeus and the whole tax collecting gig, as one commentator uh, Hughes explains from a tax collecting perspective, Zacchaeus, he had it made, okay? Because there's only three in land tax collecting posts. One is Capernaum, one is Jericho, one is Jerusalem. And so he's got one of the big three. He's got Jericho. And Jericho is a very commanding position because it's at the crossing of the Jordan River. It's one of the primary approaches into Jerusalem. And so Jericho is, is a big place to be a tax collector. It's also a very rich place uh, because of its palm forest and its balsam groves. And so here's a chief tax collector, Zacchaeus. Means that he is the head of a tax farming corporation with collectors who extorted the people. And then they paid him before they paid Rome, before they paid the Romans. Okay? So, this is who he is. And we, have, we know another thing about him. We know that he was short in stature. Alright? So, he's a, he's, a, he's a short guy. Now, likely growing up short, probably faced some level of rejection for that. So, then what does he do? He chooses the one profession. Amongst his people, that's the most rejected profession in Israel, a tax collector. It's kind of like, I'm already rejected, man, I might as well just stay that way and make some money uh, for it while I'm at it. So this is Zacchaeus, you get in the picture, and then one day he gets the news that this Jesus that everybody's been talking about and he's been hearing about is actually coming his way. And so what does he do? He actually climbs up into a tree so that he can see Jesus as he's passing by. So that gets him high enough off the ground that he can, you know, have a clear view. And so Jesus is about to walk by, Zacchaeus is in the tree, and then Jesus stops and pauses. Okay. Now can you just imagine Zacchaeus up in the tree when Jesus is walking, he stops and he looks up at Zacchaeus. I uh, just imagine him in the tree like, oh no. What is he going to do? What, what is he going to say? I just imagine that he was bracing himself to hear all kinds of things. But instead of being called names or being cast with dispersions, here is what he hears. Luke 19, 5. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. This isn't like, I'm going to come over for dinner, guys. This is Jesus like, I'm going to have a sleepover. I'm staying at the house tonight, okay? This is what he experiences, all right? And when the other people hear this, they lose it, okay? They're not happy about it at all. Pay attention to what they say. Jesus has gone into the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now think about that. They're not even going to call his name. They're not going to address this guy by his name. They're just simply calling him a sinner. And the same commentator uh, says about this nice this countryman in littleness was more than physical. Like he was a despised no one. That's exactly he is. Now was he a sinner? Of course he was a sinner. People's point in calling him a sinner wasn't to call him to step out of that and into freedom and all that kind of stuff. No, it was to delineate, delineate them from him. This is about showing that they are superior to him in, sh- in some way. Now, to be sure, this was not the first time that Zacchaeus had heard this, had been called a sinner. But here now, this wonder-working, purported son of God is passing through his place. And so he climbs up into a tree. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I just imagine climbing into a tree wasn't only about elevation. It wasn't only about being high enough to see me. I also wonder if it was about suffering silently from the wounds that he had hurt. You see, the tree provided enough safety, enough distance to be able to see Jesus without being seen. Except that he is, doesn't realize this one thing that our God's eye is always on the one. His eye is always on the one. By the way, do not forget what this story proceeds from. Okay? The story proceeds is the story of the rich young ruler. Right? 
that the rich young ruler approaches Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Jesus calls him to leave his possessions and follow him, and he walks away sad from Jesus because he wasn't willing to do that. And then what did Jesus say? Luke 18, 24. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard Jesus say this, said, so who can be saved? But Jesus said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. So how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? This is the sort of thing. It's harder than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, all right? But here, just a few verses later, we see a rich, corrupt man saved. All things are possible with him. Amen. Now, that gives us one example. Someone is suffering silently uh, through the rejection of their faith. There are many other examples. Think of the woman at the well. She had been divorced five times over. She was living in sin in this day. And so where did she go to draw water? When did she go to draw water? She was the hottest hour of the day when she is least likely to run into other human beings out there at that time. And that is exactly where God meets her and when. Suffering silently. Those who suffer rejection silently. What do they do? They may not say it out loud. They may not verbalize the message that they heard. But they're still hearing that message over and over and over again and again in their head. Some of us, many of us, I would assume, have had things spoken to us or things spoken over us long ago. And we still live under their power. It's almost like a cassette tape. just on repeat over and over and over in our minds. Just replay, replay, replay. Have you ever had someone like say or do something and your reaction to it was like, you know, 50 times what a typical response would be? That's like, whoa, that was a big response for the size of the situation. You ever notice that? You ever seen that? Pay attention to that. You know what's underneath that? It's usually hitting a message of rejection that we're not healed of yet. For all of that extra energy is coming from. But we've just been suffering silently. We've not been walking in freedom. For those of us in this category, we hear the truth of who Jesus says that we are, and we want to believe it, but we suffer in silently. This card of rejection is completely in silence as we go through life. That's one of the ways that people deal with this, is rejection. A third a different way is to power up and prove. This is a very popular way to deal with rejection. I'm just going to power up and prove it wrong, okay? Uh, biblically, you can think of Absalom. He encountered rejection from his father for what he had done to his brother. Uh, even when he returns to Jerusalem, he's not allowed to see uh, the face of his father, David. Uh, just as a reminder, he murdered his brother. Um, but, uh, which is pretty bad. Um, but nevertheless, um, what does he do in facing rejection from his dad? He, he goes out and stands by the gate of Jerusalem. And everybody that comes by, he's just winning them over. He's just wooing them to himself. And he's like, oh, if I were king, I'd make sure this took place for you. And he, he wins over the hearts of the people, away from his father David. And then he stays in the coup and drives his father out of Jerusalem. Okay, like this is, I'm going to power up and prove this rejection wrong. And when we do this, listen, some of us are not free to fight God's battles because we are busy fighting battles from long ago. We're still trying to prove that what was said isn't true. And no matter how many times we show that it's not true, we find ourselves in the same spot, still trying to prove it. And then prove it again. And prove it again. When we respond to rejection in any of these three ways, whether we lower ourselves to live by it, we suffer silently, we power up to prove that it's wrong in some way, shape, or form, we're living in captivity. We're not free. We're not living freely. And so what's the alternative? St. Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone's in Christ, the person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. The whole new things have come. Old things have passed away. It's done. New things have come. It's very interesting. We are in the perfect tense. The perfect tense emphasizes that something is completed, but that it has an ongoing result in the present. New things have come. It is done, but there's an ongoing result in the present 
from it being done. This is important because sometimes the enemy is going to want to come along and discourage you. Say, hey, you're supposed to do this new creation, but look at you. You're still doing this, you're still doing that. Don't be discouraged. God who began a good work in you, his word says he will carry it to completion. We are being transformed from glory to glory. It's progressive. When you receive Christ, you receive this new work. You receive it fully. But God's calling who you are in the end. He's calling you who you are in the end from the beginning. That's how God works. The full new creation, which of course won't be full until your new resurrected body in heaven and all that. But that's who He calls you. Okay? He calls you the end from the beginning. You see, in heaven it's finished. In heaven it's done. It's already completed, but there's an ongoing moving towards it in the present. Think of like yeast being placed in dough. It's got to be worked out into the entire batch of dough. And so we receive this gift of our salvation. It's got to be worked out into every aspect of our life. Now, if God calls you by the future that is already guaranteed, how do you think that you step into the freedom that he has purchased for you? Do you do it by looking back? No. You do it by looking to who he says you are and stepping forward toward that. So, just a little bit about this. Who are you? Who are you? First Peter 1, 15, 16 says, Like the Holy One who calls you, be holy yourselves. And all your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy for I'm holy. You know, God actually calls us saints. He calls us holy. And then we're all like, yeah, I'm a saint. You know, I'm holy. But he calls us the end from the beginning. It's who we're being made to be. It's who we are. It's, who our, it's what our identity is. And so when we talk about holiness, it's actually, hey, be who you are. Be who God calls you to be. And that's how you step toward that future. Who are you? Ephesians 4, 32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So who are you? You are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Yeah, that thing, he forgave you that. Assuming he came to answer forgiveness. John 8, 36, so the Son sets you free, you'll really be free. Galatians 5, 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subjected again to a yoke of slavery. You're free, so walk in the freedom, he said. Who are you? Ephesians 2, 10 says, we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In this one verse, we're called, we're saved, we're rescued, we're redeemed, and we are made on purpose for a mission that matters for all of eternity. That's who you are. Agree with what God says, step toward what He says. And just a word on this while we're talking about this, be very careful about allowing anything other than the Lord to define you. This matters more than most of us give it credit. Part of this is that there are wrongs done in this world, right? There, there's a time when you are a victim to some evil, some wrongdoing, some injustice. And what you have suffered, that is a part of your story. But it's not the stamp of your identity. It's not who you are. Do not allow that to equal who you are, to define the label. It's not who you are. And if part of that label is that you're bad, that something's just that you're bad, that you're broken, that you're whatever. The answer is not to say, no, I'm good. It's to say, he's good. Contrast the Pharisee in the tax club. Remember the Pharisee Jesus? That's what he thought of himself as being good. He viewed other people as being lower than him. But then the tax collector came into the temple. He's like beating his breath. He's, he's, he's calling himself a sinner, not even worthy. You know, and Jesus gives accommodation to the tax collector, but not to the Pharisee. You see, sometimes when we're told that we're bad, we fight that by telling ourselves, no, I'm good. Uh, be careful, because that's just moving towards self-righteousness, uh, which is the same thing the Pharisees did. Okay? That is not the answer. The answer is not, I'm good. It's, he's good, and he loves me, and he forgives me, and he is transforming and I am a new creation. Like, that's the answer. And when it's Christ, our new creation, you know, it doesn't say they're a new person. So they're a new creation. The work of creation is to be created out of nothing. A new 
new creation. That's what God has done and is doing. New creation. This is not like merely an improved version of yourself. I wonder if we can see our fully redeemed selves in the future in heaven, resurrected body, the whole thing. How much would we be able to recognize that that person from who we are before Christ or without Christ in our lives? Physically, maybe a little bit recognizable. I hope to be, you know, at least foot taller so far. Um, <laughs> but in terms of our our character, it's a new creation. It's a new creation. As we respond to today's message, I'm going to invite us to our head and close our eyes. And as we do, I want to address a couple of groups in this room. First group, if you're here, and you never received Jesus, you never received the Son.
forgiveness? If so, then right now in your head, in your heart, reject the lie. That you carry me and you don't forgive. That you're a sham. Accept the truth. Some of you might be, you might get through this song and still feel like you are carrying the chain that is on that cross. That doesn't mean that something's wrong. But if that is you, I want to encourage you to come up and receive prayer at the end of our gathering today. Prayer teams will be available to you. And I would love to pray with you. So I'm going to encourage you to stand up with that card, with that chain. Father, I want to come out and ask that you pour your presence out on your people right now. God, we pray that you would break chains right here, right now. We are asking that you would help us to walk in the freedom that you have given us. God, change us.